Underground to Canada, Chapter 17. In their new sweaters with knitted caps that matched, Julie and Liza were put inside a black horse-drawn carriage which, which had been waiting on the street before the large coffin home. Black curtains hung about its windows as though a death were being hidden someplace inside. Aunt Katie clasped both girls in her arms. Levi Coffin searched for their faces. His blue eyes glowed warm and steady as the light from the pine knot ember. God bless you both, he said, and closed the carriage door. The girls were alone inside. Perhaps the other slaves had gone ahead or were waiting in other hiding places. Julie and Liza sat close together, looking like strangers to each other, even in the cl closest light. Julie had never felt the warmth of new clothes. They hugged against her. It was pleasant, and she smiled. She and Liza didn't look like slaves now. Would anyone know them? Even if the door was flung wide open and mean old Sim stood scowling right before them? Rain pattered against the carriage top. The wheels sloshed through the puddles, but the rain was welcome. It was a curtain of protection. I feel safe and strong again, Julie. Liza hummed the words, and, I f and it feels like a fine, cleaned-up lady. Julie squeezed her hand. The carriage jolted steadily through the streets, and the girls jolted with it side by side. It was a short trip, for the driver could be heard calling to his horse, and the carriage began to skid as he pulled into the reins. They heard what must be their driver talking to another man. A friend with a friend, he said. And what do you want to send by freight, another man asked. Two packages of dry good, was the answer. Drive to the end of the train station, and we'll load them into the last freight car. The carriage began jogging again. When it stopped, the blurred vision of a man opened the carriage door. He was stocky with large, strong arms. You must each crawl inside one of these sacks, he said gently, tossing two gunny sacks into the carriage and then closing the door. But he continued speaking. You can breathe through the sacks and stretch around, stretch around a bit when we put you in the freight cart. Hang limp when we carry you. The girls stepped inside the sacks and began pulling them over their bodies and then over their heads. Outside, they could hear the hissing steam of the train engine and the bang and shove of heavy freight carts. I don't like being tied up in a sack, Julie. Liza scowled, and there was a look of terror in her eyes. But she pulled the harsh cloth over her head and sat waiting in the carriage seat. Julie did the same. The driver opened the door and crawled inside. He tied each sack tightly at the top. Then he picked up Liza and handed her to his waiting helper outside. Make yourself as small as possible, he told Julie, and I will carry you over my shoulder. Julie knew if she stretched out, she could be twice as long as Liza. She huddled together as she best she could. A swirling sound of people and train noises, together with the drip of steady rain, surrounded Julie. She felt the arm of a driver tighten around her. A voice cried above, out above from the confusion. Search all those carts for runaway slaves. Julie's heart pounded. She was glad for the sack and the glad for the protection arms around her. Two packages of dry goods go in, go in this car, she heard a small voice call. She was lifting into the car and carried far back into what must have been a dark corner. She was placed next to the sack that was Liza. Don't move and don't talk until the train starts, the driver said softly. You're going to Cleveland. A friend of the Underground Railway will meet you there. It's best you stay in the sacks until you reach your destination. But I'll loosen the top so you can stick your head out for the trip. He pulled the cloth down from the girl's head, but it was so dark they could barely see each other. The car began to move and the man left quiet, quickly. There was a screech and the banging of door. Wheels creaked and rolled beneath them. The car jerked and the girls felt against each other. A bell clanged. The train was fr fra freighting with strange urgency, frightening with its strange urgency. The wheels turned fast and faster, clicking over the long silver track. Julie pictured it in her mind. It would look like the track they had walked along the state of Kentucky, the sound and the speed of the wheels beginning humming inside Julie's head. She felt dizzy. Like Liza groaned each time the big empty freight cart rattled and jerked. Julie grew thirsty. Her mouth was dry and her tongue felt thick. She began to think about the rain outside and how she wanted it to pound through the car and wash down over her. She leaned against Liza. Julie Lee, Liza mumbled, I think my own bones has come loose and it's rattling around in this sack. Julie Lee had no answer. The train rattled on and on. It was going on forever. She began to think, and with all the speed, it might fly right off the tracks. Julie Lee forgot about her destination and that something, sometimes, sometime the train would stop. 
She dozed off to sleep for a time and was surprised when the freight car banged into the car ahead of them and the rhythm of the wheels began slower and slower and then stopped. Liza, Julie cried out in alarm, feeling her friend's body slumped against her legs. I'm not dead, Liza groaned. I just can't sit up. In the middle of the car, a light appeared. The door of their car slowly opened and a wild whiff of cold fresh air blew around them. I'm seeking two parcels of dry goods shipped to me from Cincinnati, a, fami a familiar voice called out. I will take care of their transfer aboard the schooner of Mayflower, personally. Julie remembered. The voice belonged to Massa Ross from Canada. He must have escaped from jail. He had come, as he promised, to take them into the land of freedom. Ah, here they are, he cried. He leaned over the girls without speaking and quickly tied the sacks over their heads. Then he picked up a girl in each strong arm and strode from the car. Within minutes, he lifted them into the carriage with heavy down curtains. He untied the sacks and at once pulled the girls free from them. Liza fell onto the floor. She was too twisted and bent to sit on the seat. Julie stooped to her to lift her and came face to face with Massa Ross. But was it Massa Ross? He had no beard. His hair was dark, red, but shorter. His chest and stomach were puffed out round and full as before, but the clothes that covered them were plain. The ruffled shirt was gone. He rubbed his smooth chin and his eyes crinkled with laughter. Julie and Liza, his voice was muffled, but still softly as he might be preaching a sermon. Praise God that you have overcome in innumerable hardships and are now on a very brink of freedom. A drink, Massa Ross? Julie, Julie could barely manage the words. Her mouth had, had the dryness of dust on the Mississippi road to the cotton fields. My dear child, the large man heaved himself down to a bag at his feet. He pulled out a bottle and then unscrewed the cap. Water gurgled into a cup. Liza first, Julie said. Mr. Ross held Liza upright and lifted the cup to her lips. Drink slowly, child, he said. When your body has been drained of moisture, it cannot stand the shock of an unlimited amount. Soon the cup came to Julie. The moisture cooled her lips. She held the liquid in her mouth. It trickled down her throat and she swallowed twice greedily. There will be more when you board the Mayflower. Mr. Ross bent down and returned the bottle to the leather bag. Now that her mind was released from the dreadful thirst, Julie realized that the carriage was moving. She could see only the outline of Mr. Ross's face in the seat opposite her and Liza. Liza clutched the seat with her, both hands, struggling painfully to straighten her back. Freedom ain't easy, Massa Ross. Liza sounded against like the sullen, angry girl of the long-aged slave cabin on the Riley Plantation. Even you got put in jail, and your face don't look so well. Mr. Ross was weary. He leaned his head back against the carriage seat. They had to release me when the slaves whose disappearance caused my trial returned. He came into the courtroom just when I was about to be condemned. Mr. Ross spoke again, but quieter this time. Injustice is the weapon of evil men. But there are always brave and noble souls who proceed on the course of right and are impervious to the consequences. I feel rewarded for all my efforts just to free the two of you. Julie was pleased with the ring of his words. Whatever Massa Ross was saying, it helped her lift her head and straighten her back and think of Mammy Sally, who never bent low to anyone. Julie thought back to the hot day in the cotton field when Massa Ross marched down the rows and chose Lester and then Adam to be his guides. Lester and Adam? Why hadn't she and Liza asked about them right away? Massa Ross would know where they were. Massa Ross, Julie blurted, blurted out in a jumble of fear and hope. Did Lester and Adam get to Canada? Mr. Ross leaned forward slowly. They reached Canada, all right, he said. They, ba they both knew freedom. He paused. Lester had a job in the town of St. Catharines. He wants both of you to come there. Adam died. There was a shocked moment of silence. Kind, gentle Adam. Julie felt the dryness again in her throat, but this time there was throbbing pain. Liza bent forward, strained her crippled back, her eyes filled with tears which ran freely over her scarred black cheeks. How did he die, Massa Ross, she asked. Mr. Ross, shoulders slumped. It was the chains. His voice was husky. They were too tight and cut through the flesh. When we filed them off, there was blood poisoning. Adam lived in Canada only one day. We buried him under a tall pine tree. There was nothing more to say. The evil chains. Julie felt herself one to pry them apart forever to strain every muscle in her body, to pull every chain loose from the legs and arms and necks of every slave. 
The carriage stopped and Julie Lee wiped the tears from her face with the sleeve of her newly knitted sweater. Before she heard about Adam, Julie Lee was going to ask Massa Ross if he had seen a tall, black-skinned woman with a proud walk who went by the name of Mammy Sally. Now she was afraid to know. The carriage jolted, the doors opened, and the girls with Mr. Ross stepped into a dusky, lead-gray street. It was evening. To be safe, they pulled their new hats far down over their blackness of their faces. They tucked their hands under the warmth of their waist-blue sweaters. <clears throat> Before them was a vast, gray stretch of water. It didn't have the sound of the rolling Mississippi. The water heaved and pushed toward the shore and then splashed it one long row of wave. Great hulks of boats anchored along its side, rocked with the rhythm of the moving water. On one of the largest sails were being pulled aloft. That one is the Mayflower, the abolitionist, abolitionist boat, Mr. Ross said. It will take you across Lake Erie to Canada under its waving sail. Then you aren't coming with us, Julie's face <clears throat> so asked soberly. <clears throat> Mr. Ross heaved his great shoulders and breathed long and in full in the vastness of his chest. I must return again to the south and free more of your people, he said. He picked up the skimpy, boundless from the carriage, picked up the skimpy yeah, bundles from the carriage floor and walked towards the boat. Keep your caps pulled down and don't raise your heads to look at anyone, Mr. Ross turned and whispered to the girls. With those new clothes, a passerby would think you were children. It's fortunate the day is gray and cloudy. It was only a few steps to the boat and at once, Mr. Ross began shaking the hands of the man he called the captain. Mr. Austin raised his voice with his usual fla flowerish, but spoke quietly. A friend with a friend, he said at first. The magic password of the Underground Railroad. Julie felt warm and excited each time she heard it. These are my children, Mr. Ross continued. Take care of this. Take them safely to Fort Malden. The captain was a jolly man with a hat cocked to one side of his head. Aye, that I will. He hung on to each word with the pearls with of laughter. Come with me, lads, to your bunks below. Mr. Ross patted each girl gently on the shoulder and bade them goodbye. He disappeared into the gray evening dusk. Julie and Liza wanted to call out to thank that this big, kind man, but both of them knew the need for silence. It would be dangerous, too, for them and for Mr. Ross if they lifted their heads and showed their black faces. The girls walked about the Mayflower with the captain. Julie felt the boat must be breathing and that she was walking over its body. It went up and down with each rise and fall of the waves beneath it. They followed the captain down a narrow flight of stairs and then walked along the corridor with tiny doors on either side. At one of them, they stopped. The captain opened the door to a little room. It was hardly big enough for the three of them to stand in. Two beds seemed to hung, hang on the side of the wall and a small round window looked out the water. I know you are lassies, the captain laughed again. Before this trip, you'll be la uh, la ladies to me and my mates. He showed the girls how to lock their doors and warn them to open it only when they heard three knocks and then the words, a friend to a friend, a friend with friends. He would bring them food and water at once. Then they were to crawl into their beds and sleep with all their clothing on. If all goes well, the captain smiled broadly beneath his thick black mustache, we will reach the banks of Canada in the early morning light. The R's in his speech trilled together like the song of a bird, Julie thought. She would have no trouble recognizing his voice behind the door that was closed. The cabin bent down and walked out of the little door. The girls locked behind them.